Thanks, guys. It's uh, really wonderful to be speaking to you this morning, Ascot Life Church. Um, as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, this morning I'm going to be finishing the series that we've been in for the past few weeks called Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled, where we've been looking at Jesus' final evening, his last supper with his disciples. So we're going to be in John chapter 17 today, if you have a Bible. But just before we get into the chapter itself, uh, I'd like you to imagine uh, who uh, someone who for you would be the most rich and influential person in the world today. Who would be, the, in your mind, the most rich and influential person living right now? Uh, maybe it might be someone like Bill Gates or, or Mark Zuckerberg with all their millions. Or maybe it might be kind of a political figure, you know, a president or a prime minister, someone like that. Whoever it is, picture them in your mind. And now imagine that somehow you found yourself on a tour of their house. Uh, but in the midst of this tour, you find yourself separated from the rest of the group and just wandering around their house on your own. And as you're wandering, you actually find yourself stumbling in on their study or their office where they do all their work. And of course, because you're such a nosy person, uh, you decide to kind of have a route around. You look at the books on their bookshelf. You look at stuff on their computer. You even see a drawer under their desk and you open that drawer. And as you're rooting around in the drawer, you find something shocking. Because what you see in that drawer is a pile of papers and on top of those papers is a note saying this concerning the life and affairs of your name for instance if it was me it would say concerning the life and the affairs of Simon Argent and as you look through these papers what you find is that this rich and influential person has actually made detailed arrangements for every area of your life and well-being. For instance, you find that they've hired a security force to be kind of your bodyguard, watching over you at all times. You also find that they've made arrangements with hospitals all across the globe so that if you should fall sick anywhere, you will receive the very best medical attention. And they might have also made deals with banks so that if ever you fall into financial difficulty, you'll just be injected with kind of financial stability and a bit of cash. As you leaf through, you see they've made arrangements for every area of your well-being. Now, I wonder what your response would be if this crazy scenario were to happen to you. I guess our first response would be to be really moved by what we see. We'd be moved at the fact that this rich, influential person that we thought had no idea who we are has actually made such careful arrangements for our protection. But I think we wouldn't just be moved and kind of touched by this. I think we'd also have a second response, which was kind of a sense of almost invincibility. <laughs> knowing that this person has made every arrangement for our life, we kind of walk through the rest of our lives, not fearing anything, but kind of uh, with so much courage and confidence because this person has our back. And you might guess that the, the reason I'm starting with this kind of hypothetical scenario is because I think that these two responses of being moved and having courage and confidence is actually meant to be our response when we read John 17, as we're about to do in a moment. See, John 17 is actually a long prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples as he's about to go to the cross. But the, the stunning thing that we find in the middle of this prayer is that Jesus here isn't just praying for his disciples, his kind of 12 followers on earth but he's actually praying for all his disciples, including us. This is what Jesus says in, in verse 20 of this prayer. He says, I pray not only for these, the ones with me, but he says, but I pray also for those who will believe in me 
through their word, through their message. What we're about to read here is a prayer that Jesus prays, not just for his disciples, but for us. And of course, as we read through this, this is going to be something that moves us, that touches us as we see Jesus' care for us in this prayer. But I think it's also something Jesus prays and kind of lets us over here so that we would have courage and confidence in our lives today. See, what Jesus specifically prays about in this prayer is our mission as his followers, our call as his followers to share him with those around us. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you'll know that this is often something that kind of puts a bit of fear and worry into us as believers. You know, sharing our faith is often something quite daunting. But Jesus prays this prayer so that we would have courage as we do that. And specifically, I want us to see three reasons that we can have courage in mission today. And that's because, firstly, as we see Jesus pray this prayer, we see that he is committed to our mission Secondly, we see that Jesus is committed to our protection whilst we're on mission. And thirdly, finally, we see that Jesus, as he sends us out on mission, is committed to our fruitfulness. Now, hoping that these kind of three things will emerge as we work through this prayer. But uh, I think it'd be good now to, to stop and read the entire prayer. It's quite a long one, uh, 26 verses, but I'll read through it and then we'll get stuck into these three points today. So this is what it says in John 17, starting at verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you gave him authority over all flesh so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given is from you because I have given them the words that you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. And I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me because they are yours. Everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine and I am glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you've given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you've given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. And now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy completed in them. I've given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they may also be sanctified by the truth. And I pray not only for these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you've given me so that they may be one as we are one. I'm in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one so that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory which you've given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you and they have known that you sent me. I made known your name to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. As we can see, as we read through this prayer, this is a, 
a rich and deep prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples and for us. And I'm kind of painfully aware that with the time I have this morning, I'm barely going to be able to scratch the surface of what Jesus prays through here. But I think one theme that, as I say, unites this whole prayer is Jesus' passion and commitment that his disciples carry on the mission. It's the first thing we see in this prayer, Jesus' commitment to our mission. See, the the prayer actually begins off with Jesus praying for the completion of his own mission on earth. In verse 1, Jesus prays this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Jesus is here praying for his own hour of death on the cross. Jesus knows that is his ultimate mission. And so he prays, Father, as I go to the cross, would you glorify me? Would, through my death on the cross, would you so glorify me that people can see your glory too? Would my death on the cross glorify you by bringing people to know you? But the really surprising thing, I think, from this prayer is that Jesus, this is the night before he goes to the cross, knowing all that he's going to experience, and yet he only prays for himself for five verses. The other 21 verses of this prayer are Jesus' calls for his Father to make his disciples fruitful in their mission. This is what Jesus says in verse 18. He says, As you sent me into the world, Father, I also have sent them into the world. This is the main burden of Jesus in this prayer, is that his disciples would be sent into the world and carry his name and his word into other people's lives. But we might pause there and ask the question, why is Jesus so passionate that his disciples share him with other people? Is it even uh, legitimate, acceptable for Jesus to be so eager for his disciples to make his name famous in the whole world to everyone who lives in the world. After all, we're aware that uh, today we live in a nation and a world of, of many cultures and many different faiths. And it's been said by some people that kind of the idea of Christians sharing Jesus with others with people who might not even believe in God or who are of a different religion, it's been said that that would be kind of insensitive of Christians to do. Uh, That's kind of forcing our opinion on others. So that's a form of arrogance to tell people about Jesus who might not want to hear about him. And I think actually we can sometimes slip as Christians, into thinking about evangelism in this way as a, just kind of an interruption, an inconvenience to the people we share Jesus with. Now, I think that one reason I personally am often reluctant to talk about Jesus with others is because deep down I kind of have this feeling it's going to be more of a bother to that person than a blessing to them. What I've loved as I've studied this prayer this week, what I've loved seeing is how Jesus has just none of these concerns. Jesus here is so committed to his disciples' mission because he knows that the word we carry is good news for those who hear it. If you look at verse 2 and 3 and see how Jesus describes his own mission when he was on earth. He says this, You, Father, gave him, speaking of himself, so you, Father, gave me authority over all flesh, over all humanity, so that I may give eternal life to everyone you have given me. And this, Jesus says, is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent Jesus Christ. How does Jesus define his mission, the mission that we carry on as his disciples? It's a mission that brings life to people, that gives people the chance to know 
eternal life, as Jesus puts it. Now, when we talk about eternal life, we shouldn't just imagine that Jesus here means just kind of living forever in some kind of vaguely spiritual life that goes on forever. That doesn't seem to be what Jesus refers to when he talks about eternal life here. Because he, he doesn't say in verse 3, this is eternal life that they may live forever. But he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. So for Jesus, eternal life isn't just kind of living forever, living forever after you die. It includes that. But for Jesus, eternal life is actually a relationship with God that gives kind of a limitless richness and fullness to life that we have never known before. Jesus says eternal life isn't just kind of living forever, but as he says in John 10 verse 10, it's kind of life to the full, living life in all of its fullness. I can remember this was really my experience when I came to know Jesus truly for the first time. I've shared this before, but uh, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in the church. Uh, but whilst I knew a bit about Jesus, in my teenage years especially, I was really looking for life and joy and satisfaction in anything other than Jesus. You know, I looked for it in sporting achievement or in academic achievement at school or, or in kind of just social achievement, in being liked and known by people. What I found is that no matter how much I achieved in these areas, it was, it was never enough to, to, to sort of scratch the itch. It, it might have given me kind of some temporary pleasure, but I always felt there was something more. I felt like I was just moving from one thing to the next. And then, when I was kind of in my early teenage years, I remember deciding to actually let Jesus into my life properly. And I tell you, it was like entering a whole new world. It was like nothing I had known before. It's like I had gone from living in this tiny room with all these kind of insignificant pleasures, and I'd gone from that to living in this wide open space. Suddenly I had purpose richer than I'd ever known. I had significance, I had value, I had love more than I had ever known before. It's like I went from limited life to limitless, eternal life in all its fullness. This is what Jesus means when he says, our mission is to share eternal life with the world. It's not just giving people a hope of living forever, though that's part of it, but it's giving them a rich life in all its fullness that begins now. This is why Jesus is so committed to the mission. Because it's not just about getting people to, to change their religious stance or to join his club. No, no. Jesus is committed to our mission because it is a mission that brings life to people, brings people richness of life. And this is why we can be confident as we go on mission. Now, as we share Jesus with people, there will be times we have to share some hard news with them, news about sin, about how we've turned away from God and need to repent. But though the gospel contains hard news, it doesn't contain any bad news for those who receive it. It is only good news. It's news of life for those who will bring Jesus into their life. It's the first reason we can have confidence on mission. is because we have good news to share and Jesus is committed to us as we do that. But as I say, there's also a another reason why we can have confidence and courage as we go on mission and that's because Jesus is also committed to our protection as we live in the world for him. You see, one reason we might be reluctant to talk about Jesus with others is because we're not totally convinced it's good news, as we've just been talking about. But I think another reason we can be uh, fearful about sharing Jesus with others is because we just don't feel that able to. We don't feel strong enough to, to put our neck out and tell people about him. And I think this is something that might be particularly relevant now. 
See, this is a year that, for all kinds of reasons, has left many of us feeling <laughs> awareness of our weakness more than before. It might leave us feeling kind of frail, vulnerable, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and the thing is, when we feel like that, I, I guess the idea of going on mission for Jesus, of sharing him with others, will not be that attractive to us because inherent in talking to others about Jesus is the risk of rejection. Now, as soon as you tell people in your workplace that you're a Christian, that, that makes you vulnerable, makes you stick out. You know, whenever you have that conversation with a family member, kind of asking them co to consider who Jesus is, that makes you vulnerable, can even put you up for kind of rejection, ridicule even. So if we feel fragile, weak, insecure, that means that rather than opening our mouths and speaking about Jesus, we'll more likely keep our mouths shut. And instead of going out into the world, we'll more likely just surround ourselves with church people, other Christians, because it's more safe, it's more secure. And I'm not saying that there's necessarily anything wrong with that at certain times in life. You know, it might be that you're listening to this and today actually you are fragile, you are feeling weak and actually what you need is just community around you. I, mean, I think alongside that, Jesus also wants us to see in this prayer that actually if we know him, if we belong to him, we are ultimately in the deepest sense secure and protected. I just want us to, to look at verse 12 and see how Jesus speaks of how he was when he was with his disciples. I just want to highlight a few words. He says, while I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you've given me. I guarded them and not one of them is lost, except the son of destruction, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus here kind of almost likens himself to a shepherd with sheep, saying, when I was with my disciples, I was like a shepherd who protected them in every way. I protected them by your name, I guarded them, and I made sure not one was lost. In fact, the only one that was lost was one who wasn't a true follower anyway. Say, all those who belong to me, I guard, I keep forever. And you might say, well, this is just Jesus talking about when he was on earth with his disciples. What about us? But in verse 15, we see that Jesus, as he is leaving the world, he makes arrangements for our continued protection by praying to his father. In verse 15, he says, I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now, this is a verse that's worth considering for a few moments because what we see here is that when we talk about Jesus' protection, we're not saying that Jesus guarantees our physical protection in every way. Jesus actually says in verse 15, I am not praying that you take them out of the world. And as we've seen in these weeks, when Jesus speaks about the world, he speaks about a a hostile, broken place that will often bring with it trouble <laughs> to those who live in it. That's where Phil Draper led us last week. He highlighted uh, in chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus saying, you will have suffering in this world. So when we talk about Jesus' protection of his disciples, we're not saying that he protects us kind of from all physical harm that could befall us. But whilst Jesus doesn't guarantee absolute protection in all physical ways, I think he does want us in this prayer to see that there is one danger. We could say maybe the worst danger that could face us. There is one danger that we are absolutely protected and secure from. Verse 15, Jesus prays, I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but I am praying this, that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus is here speaking about the Father's protection of us from 
the enemy, from the devil, Satan, as he's sometimes called in the Bible. See, as, as a Christian, your ultimate danger it is not actually physical harm. Those things are hard. This life can bring a lot of trouble and we walk with one another through that. But you know, your greatest danger is not those things, but it's actually being drawn away from Jesus. That's your biggest danger. Because if you're drawn away from Jesus, you're drawn away from life, eternal life with him. And that's what the enemy loves to do. He loves to draw people away from Jesus and into sin and death and destruction. That's what he, he, he loves to steal, kill and destroy. That's what he does. But Jesus says here, if you belong to him, if you're one of his sheep, he will not let that happen. You are protected. You are guarded. Just as Jesus guarded his disciples while he was with them, so the Father now protects you from all the schemes of the enemy. We need not fear him as we go on mission. We are ultimately protected. Our lives are in his hands. We are secure. But what I've also loved seeing in this prayer is that Jesus doesn't just kind of pray for our protection in a kind of individual sense, but he also prays for our protection in a communal sense. Because, you know, one thing the enemy might try to do is draw you away from Jesus as an individual. But if he can't do that, what he'll try and do is draw you away from Jesus' people. He'll try and isolate you. Sometimes he even tries to create divisions in churches, disagreements, which mean that Christians are isolated from one another. But what we see here is that Jesus is not just committed to our protection at the individual level. He's also committed to our protection as a church, as a body. He's committed to our unity. See this twice. In verse 11, Jesus prays, Holy Father, Protect them by your name that you've given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is saying, protect their unity. The devil wants to destroy. I pray, protect the unity. And again, in verse 21, he prays this. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. I think this is incredible good news for us to know now. Right now, we are isolated from one another. That may make us feel maybe particularly vulnerable to the enemy leading us away from Jesus. And it also makes us feel just isolated from the church. Uh, and we may even have kind of fears of, of coming back together. You know, will it be the same when we come back together? Will we be united? Will it be like being a family again? Maybe you've even joined us as a church over lockdown and you kind of think, well, when I come to ALC, will I fit in? Will I have a place? What will it be like? Well, what we see here is that Jesus is not just committed to our protection from sin and the enemy. He's also committed to our protection as a body. He will make us one. And so we can live now pursuing unity, pursuing holiness in Jesus, because he knows he is committed to these very things for our sake. We need not feel vulnerable, weak, insecure as we go on mission because Jesus says, if you know me, you are ultimately secure in the deepest way. It's the second reason we can have confidence on mission is because Jesus, as our good shepherd, is committed to our protection. But just finally, I just want to briefly reflect on one third reason why we can have confidence on mission and that's because Jesus is also committed to our fruitfulness as we go on mission. In verse 21, continues like this. He says, May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. And may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. What we see Jesus praying for here is that the world may believe our message. That as we pursue him, and as we pursue unity with one another, Jesus is praying for our fruitfulness as we share his message with the world. And I find this incredibly comforting. 
You know, two reasons that we might be reluctant to share Jesus is because we're not sure it's good news and because we feel unable, weak to do it. If there's a third reason, I guess it's that we're just not sure it's going to work. You know, I've got people in my life right now who I am looking to share Jesus with. Maybe I'm looking for that open door. or Maybe I've a few of them, I've told them about church and Jesus and I'd love to kind of further that conversation. But I guess another reason I'm reluctant is because I'm just not sure that they'll believe. Just not sure that my words will do any difference. But here, we see why we can have ultimate confidence in sharing Jesus with others. Because it's not just us doing it. It's not just us hoping that people will believe. No, no, we have the Son of God himself praying for our fruitfulness. It means whenever you go into your workplace and tell your colleagues about Jesus, he is praying that the world may believe. Whenever you find yourself in a situation with friends or family where you're opening up about your faith, calling them to know him, you can know he is praying that the world may believe. And as we come back together as church, we can know as we reunite as this body living for him, we can know that Jesus is praying that the world may believe through our message. And so we can have confidence as we do that. Jesus is not just committed to our mission. He's not just committed to our protection, but he is almost also committed to praying for our fruitfulness on mission. And so we can have confidence and courage as we go. As we finish, I want to read out a quote from a guy called Robert Murray McShane, who was a Scottish preacher from a few centuries ago. He says this, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. And yet, the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. See, church, it it might be nice to discover that there's a rich and influential person somewhere in the world looking out for every area of your protection and well-being. But in this prayer, we see something so much greater. We see that the Son of God, who is a high priest forever, who lives to pray for us, the Son of God whose prayers the Father loves to answer, He has prayed for us and is still praying for us. He's praying that we may share the message well. He's praying that we may be protected as we share. And he's also praying that we will see fruit as we do that. And so we can have confidence. We need not fear anything, but we can know Jesus is praying for me. I need not fear a million enemies. Just as we finish this morning, we're going to sing another song led by Joan Bronte, which just reminds us of the eternal life, the good news that Jesus has given us. And I want to invite you as we sing this together now, let's just let this remind us, move us as we see what Jesus has done for us. But let's let it it also move us to go and share this good news in confidence as we sing it together. So uh, we're now going to sing. I'm going to hand over to Joan Bonte.